when you work and live in the same place, the line between work and between your personal life becomes blurred. And that can bite you on both sides. When you're working, it can be very easy to get distracted and to go indulge in, I don't know, playing a video game for a while or something. But also, at the end of the day, when you should be relaxing, your computer is five steps away. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. This is Matt Reynolds. I am with Thomas Frank, good buddy of mine. Thomas is. Man, you have run a massive YouTube channel for years, and you started as a guy that really, well, maybe the thing that really made people figure out who you were was you had this leading YouTube channel for mostly students, college students, and probably high school students about how to study effectively, how to, how to, how to work effectively, um, how to be more efficient. And over time, you are no longer a college kid, right? You're, what are you, in your mid-20s? It's, uh, yeah, 28. It's been several <laughs> years since I was in college. Yeah. So you have started to transition more towards like work productivity and things that are a little mm -hmm. broader audience. And you're, you have focused over the last several weeks and will continue to focus for some time on what it's like to work from home. And so you've worked from home for a long time. I've worked from home for a long time. But so many of our listeners are working from home for the very first time. And so I wanted to talk about what it's like working from home. So first off, thank you for being on the podcast. Welcome. Absolutely. Thank you for doing this. Um, why don't you tell us really quick um, about the YouTube channel and how that sort of blew up and what were the things you focused on maybe over the last decade and what it looks like now moving forward? Yeah. So believe it or not, I've been on YouTube since 2006, which I believe was just a year after it launched. Yeah. Uh, my brother and I started a channel when I was probably 13 years old. We had ninja videos and, you know, dumb songs we put up there. And then it was dormant for a long time. And uh, in college, I was absolutely obsessed with doing as well as I could in my classes, but also in the extracurriculars. And uh, I had come across, you know, Lifehacker. Everyone probably knows Lifehacker. Sure. But I'd come across uh, another one called Hack College, which was basically the Lifehacker for college students. And uh, near the end of my freshman year, they had put up this call and said, hey, our founders are graduating. They can't write for us anymore because we're a whole, like, student-run thing. So we need some more student writers. So apply if you want, send us a guest post proposal, like a full article along with your resume. And I thought that would look good on my resume. No intention to become like a pro blogger or anything. Sure. Just like, hey, this would be a good extracurricular thing to have to show to employers I went and did something. So I spent the better part of an entire night writing this five productivity tips, or I think it was five time management tips article, just stuff that I had been learning. Sent it in, sent in a resume, sent in like a fully fleshed out LinkedIn page, thinking I was a shoe in and I got a rejection letter. <laughs> uh, so my instant thought was, well, if you can't join them, beat them. So um, I had like a WordPress blog and it was just a, it was a journal, just me journaling things that were happening in college. So I kind of had a little bit of experience with setting up a WordPress blog. I'm like, well, let's just do that again. But this time it's going to be a college tips blog. And uh, I don't remember the original name I wanted, but it was taken. So I was like, you know what? I'm a management information systems major. So I'm just going with college info geek. Why not? And uh, for about four or five years, it was just a blog uh, and a podcast starting in 2013. Wait, so when did you when did you start that blog? What year was it? Uh, 2010 okay. was the blog. Okay. And then ran it just as a small side project uh, in 2012. Near the end of 2012, it went full time. Iowa full time, so you know like <laughs> enough money to live with your roommates and <laughs> pay right. your expenses in we're Iowa. <laughs> we're Midwestern guys; we like that stuff. Yeah, I don't know if I would have made New York full time. That's right. But, uh, you know, when, when your expenses are eight hundred bucks a month, that's right. It's pretty easy to go full time. How was your traffic at that point? So you're talking about two, three years in. I would assume traffic had jumped quite a bit enough for you to be like, I think I can do this. Yeah, uh, I can't remember the exact numbers. I know like right now we're getting around 20,000 page views a day. At that point, it was probably like 1,000, 1,500. Okay. But there were a few key articles that that brought in affiliate revenue and things like that. Um, 2013, 
I had been wanting to do a podcast for a long time. My friend Pat Flynn has the Smart Passive Income podcast. You know, you've probably listened to that before. Of course. And um, I think in 2012, I had gone to a conference where he gave this great talk about why having a podcast is such a good idea. You feel like you know people, you feel like the listeners feel like they're hanging out with you. It's a much more intimate experience. And that was kind of like the light bulb moment for me. I need to do a podcast too. Uh, but I was so afraid to speak into a microphone in my room on my own, like a crazy person that I waited six months. So 2013 is when I started that. And then uh, 2014, I started getting the idea to do video. Now this was not so I could become a YouTuber. This was so I could basically spice up the blog. And my inspiration was the Fizzle guys. So Fizzle, if you don't know, it's like this um, kind of membership site for people who want to do the kind of work that you know we do, online content creator. And they have all these courses. And at one point, Chase from Fizzle was like, hey, let me take a snippet of one of my courses and make it a YouTube video and just like make it the featured image of a blog post. So instead of just a static image, it's a video. So that was my inspiration for doing YouTube. I chose YouTube as a hosting platform, not really knowing the potential that it really had. And then uh, as I started making videos, I realized, oh, this is fun. And I started watching YouTubers with an eye towards what they were doing and the editing techniques they were employing and kind of got into it. And then I think like eight videos in, uh, one of my videos went viral, quote unquote, on Reddit. And that was sort of the tipping point where I realized, oh, YouTube is where I should be focusing my efforts because there's this gigantic promotion engine built into it where if you make something good and you get lucky, I guess, uh, there is a machine there That's right. that is going to promote it for you. You don't got to go to Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn and be spamming forums and all kinds of stuff anymore. It's like, no, just make something good and the algorithm will put it out for you. Yeah. What was that, what was that video, by the way? What's the first video that went viral? That was, uh, I think it's video number seven or eight, and it's called, I don't feel like it is uh, a mindset for amateurs. It's the whole idea of... Um, in the war of art, they talk about how professionals show up every day at a specific time, whereas amateurs wait to be inspired. Yeah. So if you're a writer, say, and you're like, I don't feel like writing today. Well, if you're an amateur, you would let that kind of just halt you. But if you're professional, you'd say, well, I don't care that I don't feel like writing because I write That's at right. 8, 8 p.m. or 8 a.m. every day, whatever hour it is. And the funny thing is that video was a response to, or I guess the video was, uh, was made because I didn't have time to get the bigger video I was working on that week out because I was on a strict professional's deadline. Every Friday, I'd make a video. So I'm like, well, I gotta put something out there and threw it together, put it out there, and I guess it just struck a chord. That's amazing. So you won't say this, so I'll say this, but Thomas's, so your, your video, your channel on YouTube is called Thomas Frank, it's your name, right? Mm -hmm. Thomas Frank? Um, and you've got, you're pushing 2 million subscribers, 1.8, somewhere in that ballpark. It's a big- Something like that. It's a big channel. Um, and again, you won't say this, but the quality of your videos, you would be hard pressed to find any videos on YouTube that are higher quality than your videos. And I know they weren't like that. They weren't that certainly your, you and your brother's sword fighting with samurai swords are not the same level, but over <laughs> time you, you can see that you really cared about quality over quantity. And I think mm. it's one of the reasons that you, you stuck out. And so a lot of my leadership team knows um, about about you. You're actually a client at, at Barbell Logic. I coach you. It's been a blast. But that's they know you not because you're a client at Barbell Logic. My leadership team knows you because of the quality of your YouTube videos. And while you're making videos about productivity, and you know we've we've looked at a lot of your videos about studying and college kids and and things like that. Um, it's really the style of your video that caught us. Like it's super eye catching, very high production value. Um, very efficient videos. You don't do 40 minute long videos. They're pretty tight and packaged and, and everything that's in them is, is sort of valuable information. And so, um, yeah, we, we, we we love your, your channel. And so it's been awesome to sort of build that, uh, friendship over the last couple of years and talk through those things and talk through training. And so now you have, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, you've started then transition from that college info geek styled videos to more professional videos for really not just college kids, but for the working class and for people who are lifestyle things, productivity things. What does that look like today? And how has that morphed over say the last year or so? To me, it's less of a hard division than I think a lot of people kind of imagine. And I think the reason for this is 
people who haven't gone through this particular career path tend to see a bigger, uh, more clearly defined division between student life and work life. Yeah. And as somebody who went through student life and then transitioned into work life focusing on students, I realized that you know, a lot of it is very, very similar. The exact same techniques for focusing and staying on task apply to homework as uh, to whatever work you're doing. Yeah. The exact same planning techniques apply. All this stuff is very, very similar. So for me, a lot of it is just an issue of branding. Yeah. Not having College Info Geek in the header or at the end of a video title. Um, you know, not always calling out my my book on earning better grades as my opt-in at the end of the video. Uh, which I don't have an opt-in for working people as such. So I just send this to my music channel <laughs> sometimes. I bet it's coming though, right? I wouldn't be surprised if there's something in the pipeline at some point that's a... I mean, I guess f my, my, my tough thing with that right now is um, at, at some point I would like to make, you know, actual products for a broader demographic. But I focused on Skillshare over the past few years just because their barrier to entry is so low right. for people needing to pay. Uh, and the classes I wanted to make there were what I thought were very fundamental material. And I didn't want to lock them behind a, a pretty big paywall. Sure. So at some point I may make more professional focusing content where there is an actual sales funnel and I host the courses myself. Um, anyway, so for me, it, it wasn't so much like a, all right, I am now too old for students. I'm not doing that anymore. It was more like just gradual discussions I had with uh, Martin, my podcast po co-host, like, hey, we're, we're still hosting a podcast called College Info Geek, and we're nearing 30. What are we doing here? <laughs> so I've just been making uh, subtle shifts over time, uh, also realizing that I, I personally don't have a huge passion for talking about study tips anymore sure. uh, because I don't have to study a whole lot anymore, you know, research, but I don't have to take tests. Uh, and then I, you probably see a, an aesthetic shift in the videos. And I think that was less of a response to, you know, wanting to have a more professional image for a wider demographic and more to just coinciding with me getting very, very interested in gear and filmmaking techniques. Sure. Um, probably October or November last year when I went to see my friend Matt Diavella and interviewed him about his process, actually. It's kind of what kicked it off. It seems like you can actually see, and I, and I think when you when you do things like podcasts and in depth, weighty, high production value videos, and you do them consistently for a long period of time, you can see that that content is really a reflection of the person that's making it, right? Mm. And so it's it's probably a pretty good reflection of like you if you went back and watched all your videos for the past five, six, seven years up till now, and you listen to your podcast, you could you could see and feel the 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 morph the morphing that you're going through the transition process that you're going through from from college student to professional to like this is where my interests are and so it's hard to make content about things that you're not super passionate about anymore and like what you yeah. were passionate about three four five years ago you might not be today but i i would agree that a lot of this stuff has got a, a lot of uh, carryover value that that when you're a student your job is basically being a student mm -hmm. and so working efficiently and and um, all of those all of those skills to doing that well probably 80 85 percent of them carry over to the workplace and mm -hmm. so much of what is done as a student like the real work that's done as a student is actually not done in the classroom but is done at home in the library on your own we are in a yep. unique place now with with the coronavirus and everybody's in quarantine that the vast majority of the workforce in the United States is not at work, but in fact, if they're working, they're working from home. And mm -hmm. so I want to really focus this podcast on your work from home series and the things that you're starting to flesh out for people, because I think it's incredibly practical. So your, your very first video you came out with, it's been a couple weeks ago now, was um, on having a, setting up a specific workspace to facilitate efficient, focused, dedicated work from home. And that's that's mm -hmm. much easier for people at the office, right? Lots of people walk into an office, they shut the door, they sit at their desk, like this is where I work. And they yeah. separate themselves from that at 5 p.m. or whenever and they go home and like work is at work and home is at home. And now work is at home and home is at home and everything's at home. Yep. And so what are some of those practical takeaways for people if you want to go through even sort of a systematic progression in the same in the same way and chronologically that you did in your videos? 
what are the things like practical takeaways that people can do to 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 efficiently set up a workstation at home that is sort of separate from the rest of the stuff that's going on? Yeah. So I guess a couple of the issues that I identify with uh, home versus work, number one is uh, separation from everything else that involves your personal life. And this is kind of the toughest thing for me is when you work and live in the same place, the line between work and between your personal life becomes blurred. Mm. And that can bite you on both sides. When you're working, it can be very easy to get distracted and to go indulge in, I don't know, playing a video game for a while or something. Uh, But also, at the end of the day, when you should be relaxing, your computer is five steps away. Mm and your phone's in your pocket, and maybe you have your email app installed on your phone. So the lines can start to blur, and it can result in a lack of efficiency when you're working, and then a lack of relaxation, and that needed rest and reset time when you're done working. And then the other thing is the presence of people who have a different kind of relationship with you, because your family has a different kind of relationship to you than your coworkers. Um, Now you mentioned like being able to go into the office and close the door, Um, Maybe a lot of people listening to this podcast have that ability, but I know a lot of my younger colleagues are getting hired at companies that have open office concepts. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people even go into the office, like there is no privacy, uh, but at least your coworkers are there in the same context as you are. They're there to get work done. So you may struggle with some interruptions. And I think some of what we'll talk about uh, when, with regards to working at home, would apply to an open office concept and dealing with it, uh, but it, it does present an issue. But when you're at home, it's family, right? Yeah. So it might be kids, it might be a spouse, somebody who doesn't really innately know that you're like, you're in work mode mm. because you're home. It's a, it's a natural just inclination. Oh, he's at home, let me talk to him. Uh, so the couple of things I went over in my video where you wanna gain separation and isolation, um, and the way that I do that is just having a room that is a dedicated office. And it looks like you're in a dedicated office Absolutely. room yourself yep. right now, uh, which is great. You can close the door. Uh, you can set it up to be a single purpose workspace. Now, I don't mean single purpose as in like you have to have one room for every different task yep. you do, but this room is the work room. I don't play in this room. When I'm done for the day, I will go downstairs. And if I'm going to play a video game, I'll do it down there. Um, I'll read here, I'll research here, I'll write here, do emails here, that's like, that's about it. So if you can create a space that sort of communicates to you, puts you in the context of I'm in work mode, that's gonna help you out in staying on task and and feeling like you're in work mode. And then if you can be isolated from other people, or at least set up some systems that allow you to come to an agreement that you are in work mode and hence isolated, if not by space, but then by an agreement, that's also very helpful. Um, So the biggest thing that I I wanted to talk about in my video is like not everyone has a dedicated room to turn into an office. Some people live in like a one bedroom apartment or something like that. So the thing that I would do if I was uh, lacking in space, which I have been at that point in my life several times, is number one, Try to set up at least a desk that is not facing those things that represent your personal life. Uh, And if you can't set up a permanent workspace, just make it part of your routine. Like get at a folding table, set it up every day, put your laptop on it. And that actually has a nice benefit because at the end of the day, you put it all away and you can't really work anymore. That's right. I mean, I guess you could use your phone, but your workspace has been put away for the day. And there's this concept called the 22nd rule. It's in Sean Anker's book, The Happiness Advantage. Um, 22nd rule refers to this other concept, which he calls activation energy. To start doing anything, there is some required amount of activation energy, which is a combination of energy and the time that it takes to get into it. So my guitar is right there. If I wanna play guitar, the activation energy is incredibly low. I can pick it up in two seconds and be playing it. But if it's in the case, with the humidifier stuck in the strings, packed away in my closet, very high activation energy to start playing the guitar. Mm. So because guitar is a great habit to be in and because I wanna become a better player, I wanna lower that activation energy as much as possible. And the 20 second rule kind of refers to this arbitrary benchmark of make it take less than 20 seconds if it's something you wanna be doing more of. On the flip side, make it take more than 20 seconds, make it as inconvenient as possible if it's something you wanna be doing less of either altogether in the case of a bad habit 
uh, or at a specific time of the day in the case of you know working past your your designated work stop time. So that's a kind of a nice benefit there. I, I love that stuff. I was going to say on a on a personal note, I started working from home um, five six seven years ago. We homeschool our kiddos. My wife's a stay at home mom, and I thought I had this idea when I sold the gym and I went from working at the gym to doing online coaching at home that um, I had an idea what homeschool looked like. I was wrong <laughs> because I wasn't <laughs> at home. And so I thought, well, you know, everybody's like working quietly at the dining room table. We've got this big dining room table, like a big sort of conference table that I built and it's giant. And I thought there's tons of room and we can all just sit down and work together as a family and I'll be on my computer and they'll be doing, no, 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 no. That worked. Not First off, not at all. And that <laughs> lasted about eight days. And then I was like, okay, I can't do this. And I went out and bought a desk and put it in my basement and set up the dedicated workspace and I had the thing. And so, and mm -hmm. here, the, and, and, then, and then you have to have those maybe uncomfortable conversations with your family sometimes that are like, hey, um, I had to teach my family what a Pomodoro was. All of our listeners know what Pomodoros are. I know you're a big fan of those as well. Like, hey, I'm doing a Pomodoro, which means do not, unless the house is on fire, you are, do not interrupt me. And then I've, I've taught my family we often will do Pomodoros together. Now, my, my kids, I'm downstairs right now. My kids are upstairs doing homeschool. And sometimes we'll all kind of yell at each other like, hey, let's do a Pomodoro. Here we go. We're going to start in 60 seconds. And we start the, and we do it together. And then nobody speaks, right? And so it works really, mm -hmm. really well. Um, I have the advantage of having an office here. I have a library upstairs. The library upstairs is half books, half whiskey, which is fantastic. And so I, I have this thing at about two in the afternoon. I don't want to be in this office anymore. This office feels more corporate-y to me. I'm doing more of the urgent um, urgent and important jobs, but not non-urgent and important, not creative jobs, not building. Yeah. And so a lot of times I will, I, I will make that context switch and I will do my afternoon work up in the library. Maybe I have a, a drink of whiskey. I have got, I've got nice leather chairs and I've got good books and I've got good desks and I'll go up there and I'll do the creative work up there because down here doesn't feel creative. Down here feels like this is what somebody, a CEO is doing and sort mm -hmm. of kind of running the business and the ins and outs and the X's and O's and so it works really well. Uh, but I love, my favorite part of your video was actually the part you just talked about was for the people who live in the small apartment who don't have an office. And you actually show like you're setting up the card table, like you set up the card table, you put the laptop down, you face the wall, you're not facing the TV, you don't see the family, and you sit down and you get your work done. And then when it's over and you d decide like, hey, the work day is over, you fold up the card table, you put it back in the closet, you do it. And you, again, you've got this sort of transition from work mode to family mode. And I think that's, that's extremely valuable for people to learn how to do. There's probably a ton of people right now that are trying to figure out what that looks like for them. And they haven't quite figured out the balance there yet. Yeah, I used to do it in my apartment, even though I didn't have to. I had a dedicated, like one, our two bedroom apartment, one of those bedrooms was my studio. Yep. And my editing computer was in there, but I hated writing in there because I had blackout curtains mm. over the giant windows. And my computer could only go right in front of those curtains, which meant that opening them was basically just never gonna happen. Yep. You know, uh, and I had to have it blacked out because they would change the light levels of my videos and make very jarring cuts. Yep. So I'm like, I don't want to write and do creative work in this dingy, dark editing cave. That's right. <laughs> and I, I still don't like my basement is a studio. My editing computer's down there, but it's there's no natural light. Yeah. So I don't do creative work down there. It's in this office. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, if you even if you have like a home office, like there's always the potential to set up a little mobile workstation somewhere. That's right. Um, you had talked about context switches and how the first part of your day is sort of the more corporate CEO hat on. Yep. You've got the white filing cabinet in the that's corner, right. <laughs> and then the rest of the day is up in the library. Yep. Well, that's an instance of being able to context switch by going to a different location. I love doing that, especially when you know we're not in quarantine. I can go do one part of the day's work at one coffee shop and then take a walk to the other coffee shop. But for me, the big benefit of doing that is not so much the new location, that is nice. It is the break in between where I get to go for a walk and go somewhere. And at least for most people listening to this at this point in time, um, I believe you're still allowed to go outside and go for a walk. Sure. You have to put a mask on, but that's a big way that I context switch is I'll get something done and I'll just go out for a walk around the block, around the park, or do something or go do some pull-ups in my door frame thing. Just get myself out of the office for a little bit and, and take move. a short break. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're the same way. It's interesting how I, I spend a lot of time thinking about, I'm sure you do too, 
how to avoid unintentional context switches and then how mm -hmm. to do intentional context switches well, right? So you think about mm -hmm. that, doing Pomodoros in the same place. You know, one of the things you talk about in the podcast that we're, I'm a huge fan of are, are, are good headphones, things that block, yes. like the things that sort of block out our senses to help us be better at ignoring. And so I've got, I, mm -hmm. I would be embarrassed for my people to know how many of my listeners to know how many how many headphones I have. So, you know, I mean, I've got, I've got the Sony's and the Bose noise canceling headphones that go over the ears. I've got two or three different sets of the podcast headphones. I've got the jobber elites that go inside my ears, the earbuds I've got all because I have different reasons for using some of those things. But for me, mm -hmm. I'm pretty good at not getting distracted with vision and some people aren't right. Like I can go work in the coffee shop or I could go work in the, at the park, but it's the sound. I have to put yeah. on something to block out the audio. And that's for me. And so that helps me avoid those unintentional context switches so I can stay in work mode and that kind of deep work, that kind of Cal Newport sort of stuff. I love that. But then there comes a time during the day where I'm like, okay, this has to end and I need a true context switch, a true change of environment because I'm changing who I am. And then I do the same thing when I'm done with the creative work, when it's time to go into family mode, to dad mode and to mm -hmm. husband mode. And one of the things that we'll often do, we're, we're pretty early to bed, early to rise. So then we're also relatively early dinner eaters. So we'll eat dinner at five or five 30 or something. And so we like cooking dinner as a family. So we, we turn on the Alexa and we turn on music and we listen to maybe it's classical music or, or bluegrass or something that we enjoy. And we cook together as a family and that becomes a transition period out of work, mm. out of homeschool mode, out of those things and into like, hey, it's family time. Now we don't yeah. work, we keep our phones put away, phones are facing down on the counter on the other side of the of the room and, and it works really, really well for us. And so it's, all of those are, I think are good practical takeaways for things that you have to think about. How do I avoid the unintentional context switches that take lots of time, right? That just mm -hmm. five, six, seven minutes of distraction all of a sudden I'm like, it takes me a long time to get back into deep work. But then how do I do the ones that I really want well? I think are yeah. important. Well, you brought up sound, and I think it's something that people don't often consider, but unlike sight, sound is an involuntary sense. It's always on, and you don't really get to choose whether or not you perceive sound unless you block it. Uh, I think about this a lot with my fiance because she is a visual artist and draws a lot, whereas I'm a musician and I uh, make videos. So unfortunately, uh, for two people who are always in the house with each other, my form of art she has to experience <laughs> uh, <laughs> whether she likes out. it or not that's right or block it out yeah so like uh, the way that i've adapted to this is uh, vocal practice i have to go up in my closet and do it into shirts that's funny because <laughs> otherwise she's gonna have to hear it um you know or guitar weirdly she doesn't care about the guitar as much maybe that says something about my vocal quality there you go I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Need but more for lessons. her it's like she's on the couch on her ipad i don't i don't see it unless i physically walk over there and go see it sure so getting a good pair of headphones or at least a sound isolated space is kind of an important thing. And most people don't have a sound treated space, so headphones are the good way to go. That's right. Let's transition a little bit into from the workspace to the actual productivity of the work itself. And that was mm. the next video you put out about things just about how to be efficient. And you give all kinds of practical examples there about how to do lists. You've got lots of videos on your channel about this sort of thing, about Pomodoros and how to do lists well and apps that do lists and great ways to do it and and how to prioritize what to work on first. And so let, let's start with some of the most basic things that people can start with today who are who have maybe never worked from home and now they've got the space that they can work at, but they're used to being in this dedicated, I drive to the office and I go to work and I do this thing. And or my or even the office schedule dictates dictates the daily schedule. I've got to be there at eight in the morning. I take the lunch break at noon. I get off at five. What mm -hmm. do things look like when you get to home? What are some of the, the big practical takeaways that our people can can take that are working from home for the very first time? Yeah, so that second video is about planning and prioritization. Um, I've got another video coming out about pure motivation and productivity, staying on task. But the big problem is when you work at home, every decision becomes yours. And this is something that I think most people experience to some degree in college, transitioning from high school to college. There are no parental figures anymore. You do at least have a class schedule. Uh, when you work at home, there is no class schedule. So uh, seemingly mundane decisions. Um, and these are things that a lot of people would say like, oh, you know, if you can't deal with that, like wh what's wrong with you? How, you're not productive at all. But a lot of people struggle with the fact that every single decision becomes theirs. When do I wake up? 
What do I eat for breakfast? In what order do I do things? Do I shower first? Do I eat breakfast first? When do I start working? Where do I start working? There's all these things. So I like to divide myself into kind of two characters. There's the CEO mode or the planning mode, and then there's the robot mode. So I will go into a planning mode and plan what I'm going to do at a different period in time. So that way I can then go into robot mode and my job becomes to execute upon the plan set by my, my uh, prior self. And for me, one of the biggest things is making myself accountable to some kind of external system. In fact, working with you as a coach is incredibly valuable for me. Uh, I mean, you probably saw my workout came in at like 7.30 or 8 p.m. last yep. night. I woke up, I, oh, I uh, made breakfast, I had a lot of work to do. I was working until about 7.30 at, in the evening. And what my brain said was, oh, I don't wanna lift today. Right. I've been doing pretty good, like I could skip, but wait. If Matt doesn't see those videos, he's gonna yell at me. <laughs> so I'm gonna work out. That's right. So and it worked out. And the, and the fact that I have to send you videos means I can't sandbag. That's I right. can't like only do two sets or do one set. I have to do all three because the videos have to go to you. That's right. It's like it's a perfect system of accountability. So everything for me is like, how do I get accountability? And it doesn't have to be to another person. Now, if you're working from home and you're not working for yourself, you probably have a boss, which is great. But I I have a whole career's worth of experience knowing that uh, you can get the work that the boss expects to get done done, but you can do it in an unhealthy way, such as uh, waiting until like the day before the deadline to do all of it. That's right. And I mean, I'll be honest, I'm kind of terrible about this. I'm a very deadline crunchy kind of person. Um, so if I can get some sort of system there, whether it be a plan like a daily plan that I write out on a whiteboard every day with three or four tasks in the order I intend to do them, that's helpful. Yep. If I can you know, talk to a friend who's also working at home, be like, hey, what are you doing today? I'm, I'm gonna do these things. I'll tell you at the end of the day when I get them done. That helps too. Uh, for planning and prioritization specifically, the main thing I would say is try to keep your list limited. It's very easy to just dump everything you think you're gonna get done onto the task list and then what a lot of people find is they are not getting anywhere near the amount of tasks done as they planned. And this creates a gap between your intention and your ability to do things. And if you let this gap go on for too long, you no longer understand what your ability is on any given day. That's right. You just have these outsized intentions and constant disappointment. <laughs> so you wanna be constantly making observations of when that gap manifests itself and then working to close it over time either by working more efficiently, more actions per minute, more hustle, or by scaling back and being a little more honest with yourself. Yeah, yeah, that self-honesty I think is a huge piece. To, to argue, argue even maybe from, I, I don't think I'm wired quite the same way you are with this sort of stuff. I'm not, I am not a procrastinator. Um, I probably was when I was a student. I wasn't crazy about being a college student and whatnot, I just wasn't passionate about it because I'm passionate about my job that I do now Mm -hmm. I, I am the, if I'm not careful, uh, I will make lists and I will not be able to relax and transition into husband and, and father mode if I have things hanging over me. So I can't mm -hmm. procrastinate because I can't relax. Um, and so what I, what I do, and I noticed what you said in the video, a lot of times you, you make this sort of list of, of a, a, a clearly manageable list, three, four things that you can manage. And you talked about tackling the most important one or the biggest, most audacious one first. Because that's the one that really makes you feel like you accomplished something that day, right? Yeah. And I do something very similar, although what I do a lot of times, I get up super early in the morning, and I've got a list that I, I work through every, every day pretty quick, um, pretty efficient at building the list. I will spend my first hour of the day, which is often like 5 a.m. to 6 a.m., knocking out as many of the small things as I possibly can, but I only give mm -hmm. myself an hour. And so when it gets mm. to, if I get up at 5.30, it'll be 5.30 to 6.30. But my first hour of the day is knocking out small things because I feel like, oh man, I knocked out 13 things in the first hour and then I move on. And then there's also sort of part of this, like I'm waking up, there's a little more distraction, I'm making coffee. And then, you know, by the time I'm an hour in, I'm really in work mode. And then wham, I hit that big thing. Like, here's the thing I have to work on and really, and then I get that done. And now I go, okay, now I've had the, I've completed the biggest, most important thing for the day and 11 other small things. Mm -hmm. And so I feel pretty good. And it's, it's 10 a.m. And I'm like, now what do I get to do? Well, what that does for me is that again, by lunchtime or shortly after lunchtime, it allows me to transition into creative mode 
because I can't go up to the library and do creative mode and concentrate on building the business and how are we going to expand and reaching new markets if I've got a bunch of those urgent things on the list. And so it, yeah. lets, it lets me do both. Um, I, think, I think, again, I think one of the great takeaways there is to establish the system that works of lists and accomplishing and being accountable to something, whether it's that list, whether it's an app. You've got lots of apps that you talk about, about productivity apps and list apps and, and, and things like that. I love that stuff. I, I'm constantly doing that. Um, and I, I love the feeling of checking off something. Like, it feels great. Yep. And so that's it's a big why piece. I use a whiteboard. Yeah, it's one. It's wonderful. I like checking it and making the shape. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> me too. It's funny how that the apps have actually gone that way, right? It's interesting how the apps that a few years ago mm -hmm. apps didn't often have automatic. You know, like the, now it's got to kind of fill in the bubble with the check mark, and it wasn't yeah. like that a few years ago. And I think the apps realize like people, there's something satisfying about <laughs> touching that little bubble and be like, it's it's over. I filled it in. Mm -hmm. So yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I love your tip about giving yourself a just an hour yeah. to do those small tasks. Because that my big thing is if I do the small tasks, I have a way of spawning them, either spawning more tasks out of them or making them way bigger than they should be. I mean, yesterday I was like, all right, going to clear my inbox. One email was somebody asking me questions about YouTube sponsorships. I wrote them a book. Right. And then after that, I'm like, hmm, I wonder if this could be an interesting business relationship. So I like uh, started up a conversation with my agent and I'm like, hey, you know, let's evaluate this creator and like see if we want to talk to them. And that, that took like an hour. Sure. Sure. So, you know, one email. <laughs> yeah. To me, nothing is more frustrating. The most frustrating days are when I get to the end of days, I've, the day, I feel like I've literally worked my butt off. And I'm, and you know, my wife is like, what did you do today? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like that's incredibly frustrating right like I, yeah and even for us uh, i was thinking about this when i was watching watching that second video that you made we are very much an output oriented business i actually don't mm. care about your action i mean your actions lead to the outputs but i i, I think i've used this as an example like 10 times on my podcast at some point it's going to come back to bite me but i don't think he's heard it yet i have an uncle uncle danny i'm going to call you out so this guy works his butt off all day, every day, and has never accomplished anything in his entire life for like 40 years. He's the guy that decides like replace the drywall in his house, tears all the drywall out of his house, and like two years later, there's still no drywall in his house. Well, like that's mm. to me, that's worthless, right? And so yeah. as, as, a, as a boss and CEO, one of the things I'm, I'm constantly preaching to both myself and my, and my leadership team, especially my staff, is that output is what matters. I, yep. And I... I don't pay hourly wage. I don't pay anybody hourly. I hate paying hourly. Hourly encourages slow work. I'm paying for mm -hmm. output. We get things done. And if yeah. my leadership team who makes, you know, people that are making good salaried money can do everything and accomplish all of this stuff on 20 hours a week, beautiful. If it takes you 60 hours a week, that's fine too. But what we're doing is we're, we're doing output. And so to yep. me, that action item, you, you can be very, you can get caught up in the busyness without actually accomplishing anything. And that's, you know, if you work on a video for three weeks straight, but you never post the video, what good was it until you get that mm -hmm. video up? And so that's- Or in my case, I will I will focus on elements of the video that don't really matter. Right. Like, oh, hey, the easing curve in this movement of the transition, <laughs> it doesn't please me enough. There's not enough motion blur in it. And then my fiance will be like, Nobody cares. Yeah, no one's going to notice that but you, right? Nobody cares that your EQ dip is at 400 hertz instead of 600 hertz. <laughs> right. No one cares. Right. And it, it's very hard for the artist in me to understand that. Yeah, that's good. So we've talked about where you set up your space and how you sort of create some separation between your workspace and the rest of the world. And we've talked mm -hmm. about some of those strategies. And the best thing to do is to go to your YouTube channel, the Thomas Frank YouTube channel, watch those last couple YouTube videos and then explore for a while because you got some great stuff on there. And again, I've watched a ton of even like the, the college style videos that are, I can pick up the carryover and the, you know, the, the theory and the philosophy that you're sort of, we're preaching at that time to 19, 20 year old kids still works tremendously for me. So there's lots of stuff to mm. explore there. Um, what you said, you're, what is the next video you that you're about to launch the video number three in the series? Yes. Yeah, so the next one is going to be the, just the best remote apps. And I need to figure out how to make that video without listing a zillion apps because, yeah. man, I, I seem like every day I go to Product Hunt, there's something new for work for home. People are stepping up, which sure. is great. So it may have a companion article that lists off some more. 
And then the last two in the series are going to be uh, one on general motivation, staying on task, productivity, and then a work-life balance episode. Awesome. Which I think will be pretty important. Awesome. I love it. Uh, please go see. Like we, we've kind of hopefully we, we've sort of wet your appetite for this sort of thing, working from home and being more efficient. And here's the thing: I tell my kids all the time, in, 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 with homeschool especially, I've got one that's 15, and the curriculum that we use is incredibly difficult, and so it's a lot of work for her. But I remind her that for most of us, the work is finite, and the more efficient you are at it the more time it opens up for the things that you really want to do, the things that are truly important but not urgent. And so I remind my kids frequently, like, hey, if you get up early and you hammer the, home, the schoolwork, then often by lunchtime, you're done and you can go do whatever you want. You want to go play with your friends. You want to, you want to have them over to the house. You want to go play video games. You want to watch Netflix. You want to watch YouTube. All of those things are now available to you. And so I think uh, that is one of the great takeaways from this is that the more efficiently we work, the more time we have to spend on the things that we really love on our, on our relationships with our family and our friends and those things that really build value for us. Maybe that's reading books that are outside of work. Maybe it's reading fiction books. Maybe it's whatever those things that, that we do that bring us value. I want to create as much time as I can for those things. And that's why I think I'm I'm crazy about studying all these things like you about work efficiency because I want to get the stuff done quickly. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, I love it, dude. Thanks for being on the show again, Thomas Frank. Thomas, what's the easiest way to find you? I, obviously, your YouTube channel. What else do you want our listeners to know about you? Well, the easiest way is probably put my name into Google. Yes, <laughs> but then don't click on anything about the older Thomas Frank. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Because there's, there's another well-known Thomas Frank. Uh, YouTube.com slash Thomas Frank is the YouTube channel. And then uh, Twitter, Instagram, those are both Tom Frankly or ThomasJFrank.com. Are you still doing a podcast? Yeah. Yeah. So we are going to end the College Info Geek podcast, as it is so named, at episode 300, which I think is the end of May. And then we're going to roll right into just a name change and we're going to keep going. Nice. Um, I want to change the name so we have more freedom to talk about things that don't necessarily have to do with productivity and student life. Yep. You know, I, I want to talk about like, hey, we set up a video editing server and here's the whole experience behind that. Like, I would love to be able to just geek out about yeah, interesting that stuff. kind of stuff sometimes. Yeah. So yeah, it's going to be kind of like Martin and I talking with a sort of productivity bent. That's awesome. And yeah, that'll keep, that'll just be going right from June. Oddly enough, I'm not in, I, I know that this very podcast is right in, this might be number 300 for us. It's within it? one or two. I think we put out 297 the other day. And so it's definitely within a couple, 300 podcasts, a lot of podcasts. I've it's a lot of podcasts. It's a lot of talking. For and sure. then I did 200 with Listen Money Matters. So I think I've done oh my year gosh, 500. 500 podcasts. <laughs> then how many videos have you put out, especially since you started the College Info Geek and it, that kind of first group that that then eventually kind of took off i count main videos yeah so i'm working on video 195 right now okay man that's a bunch too i need to look mm -hmm. and see where we are we're i think we're maybe at 100 or 110 somewhere in that ballpark mm -hmm. maybe a little more than that so it's a lot right like bu building out content and for for you you are a content producer like that's i would assume yeah. that's that's your job that's what you consider i think for yeah. us one of the things that that's interesting for us is that we are a service company the thing mm -hmm. that pay, the pipeline that pays the bill is online coaching. That's what that's what we do. So content for us, well, at this point, the numbers are good enough that the content brings in some revenue because of the size of the business. The content is really the free thing we put out to sort of build pre-trust and education in, in future potential clients and also to continue to educate our current clients. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is it's a lot of work because we're we're putting out you know, a video a week, three podcasts a week, two articles a week, plus a newsletter a week. That's a lot of content. And we're not a content company. Yeah, we're a service company. And so I'm like, Whew, this is a bunch of work. <laughs> so it's uh, <laughs> you've been doing it for a long time. You've been doing it for a decade now, really, at, at this point, just about right. So yeah, especially coming up for, on a decade. That's crazy. So thank you for being on the show, dude. I'm excited about what you're doing. So interesting story really quick about Thomas as we wrap this up is Thomas started he, he we talked about doing barbell logic and you were going to train and do barbells and you were excited to, you are a rock climber that's kind of one of your that's one of your physical passions and mm -hmm. uh talked to him about getting him strong and and not driving up his body weight very much and just as he got ready to start barbell logic the quarantines hit and so he had to start his training <laughs> at home 
kettlebell, body weight, pull-up bar in the doorway. And you're a pretty tall guy. So those pull-ups, those chin-ups mm-hmm. in the doorway are not super easy because, because you really <laughs> got to yank your feet up underneath your rear end. And so you've done a great job, though. So we are working on building work capacity in you. And eventually, they'll open the, uh, they'll open the floodgates and lift the quarantine. And we'll put the barbell on your back. I'm excited to see where you go from a strength and strength perspective and how it then carries over to your to your rock climbing for sure. I'm excited to where that's going. Yeah. Oh man, I cannot wait for that rock climbing gym to open back up. Yeah, you'll you'll love it. That that's also my my barbell gym. So right, they're both there. there. How much do you get to? So you you live in Colorado. How much do you get to? Uh, do you get to rock climb on real rocks as opposed to inside the gyms? I've actually never done it. Really, only inside. Yeah, I've gone hiking a bunch. I've done like a little bit of light bouldering, but uh, I, I've always looked at the slabs and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm not, I shouldn't safely do this, you know, and obviously I, I don't even have the gear. I don't own a rope. Right. Um, so I've been climbing in the gym for a couple of years. And if all this quarantine stuff lifts by the time uh, that it's, you know, still warm enough to climb outside, I would like to find somebody to go with yeah. and teach me like, Hey, this, you know, I'm sure there are things that I need to know that are not taught in the gym. Yeah. They're different from an inside gym with, yeah, Mm -hmm. with the synthetic handles and stuff. Well, thank you again for being on the show again, Thomas Frank at YouTube, or you can just Google his name. That's what I tell people at this point. If you can't find this guy, then you probably don't deserve to find his content. It's pretty, (laughs) he's pretty easy to hunt down. Thanks for being on the show, man. And we, for the new listeners, we will talk to you here in a couple days.